Hi, I'm Rigger. This is You're Right, and today we're going to reflect on some concepts. Before that, though, be sure to like the video if you like it, share it if you think others would like it, let me know any thoughts in the comments down below, and subscribe if you want to see more. To get started, if you haven't seen it yet, be sure to check out the first episode of this, where we made Ruby. Or even possibly before that, when we talked about the idea of a mirror universe at all. Both of those will be linked at the end of this video and in the card, so grab them if you need to. Those will give you some background on what we're sort of doing here and some of the ideas we've already come up with or might be using, and I might reference them during this video, so that'll fill you in. Also, there's a few absolute mad lads have sent me fan art of the Ruby concept, which is amazing. Look how cool these are. My art may be bad, but you lot are awesome. On top of that, I had some people ask if they could do their own character concepts for Mirror Mirror Universe in some videos and stuff. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Mirror Mirror is a concept that I'll keep working on, but if you want to take a swing at making a video on your own ideas, of course, feel free. I would also like to thank those people for asking permission, because of course there's no way I could actually stop you if I wanted to, and that means that you're good people who really care. But I have no intention of trying to stop anyone or reprimanding anyone. If you use things from other people, give credit and be nice, but hell yeah, make your concept. Let creativity flow. It's the greatest compliment ever to say that I've inspired you to make something, as far as I'm concerned, so go for it. And if you do make things, please send them my way, because I absolutely want to see them. Hell yeah. However, do not link them in these video comments, because all links in my comments are just filtered out, because it makes things way easier, and they won't be seen. I'm sorry, I know that that's harsh sounding, but it keeps the bots away, and it keeps everyone safe from links and everything, including me, so that's just how it is. So, instead, send them to my Twitter, at you alright. It's easy to remember. Um, but also, yeah, please follow me there to see what some of these awesome people are sending, it's so cool. So, again, please send them my way, but send them to Twitter. But now, onto the content. So yes, last time we made Ruby, now we're on to, I guess, the next girl. Today we're making Weiss. Remember, it's a mirror universe, so if you think Weiss is best girl and you're one of those people that love her, I'm sorry, she might be worst girl here. She is not a good person, but hey, that's the concept, right? So approaching this one, I thought about how do we get everything we want out of the story? So here's the idea. Rather than flip her one for one, let's just flip some parts of her story so we can get the same results. What we want is for her to be sort of on the same path until their volume three occurs. Like They're in the same places, in the same teams, doing the same things, but the reasons why they're doing them and the circumstances around those things have changed. For instance, we're not going to flip like her sort of position in the story. You know, she comes in as the super rich girl who could inherit one of the biggest businesses in the world. So in a mirror universe, she would be super poor, right? No, we're not doing that. We want her to still have those things at her disposal. It's more the characters we're flipping, the people. It's similar to a Ruby concept, how she's on the same path, but she's a different person. She went in more fueled by revenge and motivated with a harder mindset from her dad's teaching. Here, we'll make Weiss a conniving cold manipulator for real. See, when she first appears in the story in the normal canon, she was sort of cold and scheming, or at least on the outside, but underneath we found out the caring, emotional person we all love. We just had to sort of, you know, chip away at that exterior. Here, that's what we'll flip. She actually is very cold, calculating and manipulative. But because of that, outwardly she's very friendly and putting up an emotional, warm and caring front to take advantage of other people. But to go any further, we'll have to talk about the Schnees in general, because this one runs deep. So it's going to go all the way back to Nicholas Schnee, actually. We know that he did huntsman training and became who he was so he could travel the land and dig his family out of poverty and make a business. And he believed in putting heart and soul into what he was doing and had good intentions, built a good business, but was also a very successful business. Here, we're going to flip that. So he if he does the same thing, he starts off pretty poor, but he goes and sort of takes over the world doing this, becoming a huntsman, etc. And winds up, you know, taking over pretty much most of global distribution of dust, and makes the powerhouse of the SDC. But that includes its shady practices. Along the lines Jacques uses today, it was built on those foundations. Mirror Jacques, instead, came along who is a good man. See, this Jacques does a betrayal to them, but they're the bad guys. So what he does is, Mirror Jacques comes up as a good man but concerned about the business practices, but he pretends to be all business and cold to convince Nick to let him take over. He marries into the family, he keeps up the charade, and once he has control, he starts working to try and improve the conditions of the SDC. But it's buried in bureaucracy and the politics of Atlas as well, so it's difficult. He's making progress, but it's slow going, even now. And one big reason for that is also Willow in this universe. She is quite strict and heartless. She believes in the way of the Schnees, 
And Jacques is not as strong-willed as we know him, he's quite meek. So he might be in a position of power, but he's almost more of a figurehead as Willow is this strict controlling force over his shoulder pressuring him and manipulating things to work against him, trying to not let anything endanger the Schnee legacy and their business and their money. You know, he's basically terrified of his own wife, wondering if he'll, you know, wake up dead, so they say. Or at least if he steps too far out of line. Growing up in that house, Y sees this weakness and plans to take over the STC, so it's run right again, more the way that Nick did. So I think Jacques is worried, not wanting to hand over the business to someone who will follow in the path of the Schnees. He has the right to sort of nominate where the power will fall, but it is a business, it doesn't have to go down the family line, but anyone else he's looking to give it to would fall victim to the Schnees, most likely. So he has this weight on his shoulder of trying to pick where the power should fall, at least after his reign is done. He is very wary about Weiss inheriting it, as he doesn't know if he can trust his own children. You might think that's paranoia, but he's actually right. Starting out, Weiss was a horrible child with a nasty side, but quickly when she matured, Cured, Weiss learned from Jacques' tactic and used it against him, putting on the nice friendly daughter act for most of her life, passing off her younger behaviour as just that, immaturity, but now she's grown up, she's corrected her ways, you can totally trust her with the SDC. Weiss, taking a note from Nick, whose legacy she also wishes to restore, she says she will prove to her father that she is a good person and she will leave Atlas, leave the riches of home, leave the comforts and study abroad to become a huntress and help people to prove herself. This is actually a two-pronged attack by Weiss. See, not only is she trying to get him on side believing her, but she's also training herself up for combat just in case, but not under the watchful eyes in Atlas. Not to mention, again, it follows the journey Nick took, ensuring he was strong enough to take what he wanted. This leads her to Beacon, where she plays nice, being very friendly towards Ruby and Yang, latching onto their strong, more disciplined, almost military approach to things. She manages to, over time, get others to trust her and crack their shells, especially with Ruby, becoming really good friends and strong partners. She proves her worth and her own skills. Now, when it comes to Blake, it's interesting. She really isn't discriminatory. I think that's a bit much and we don't need it. Instead, she simply sees it as an opportunity, a PR move. She has a fauness on her team though. Therefore, even more evidence, she'll make a good leader and good leader of the SDC. See, she clearly cares for everyone. You can totally trust her. To be clear, she totally intends to run the SDC like modern Jacques does, exploiting everyone. It's not discrimination. She treats all workers badly, or she will. She cuts corners for money. She doesn't care, it's about making the Schnees powerful. It's just unfortunate a lot of those struggling in the lower class that'll take those jobs are Faunus. But it's not because she hates Faunus, she just doesn't care about anybody. But while she isn't discriminating, she has no intentions of fixing anything either. It'll make more money and increase the SDC's power and that's what matters. But yeah, she bonds strongly with Team Ruby, encouraging them to do things together, socializing with friends to try and get other powerful allies from other teams as well. Her plan is really working. That brings us to Winter though, who I've been trying to figure out and I think I have it. I think that she escaped her family similar to how she did in the real story but under new circumstances because she didn't want the responsibility of the SDC. She was sort of in line if it was going to be inherited, but she wanted to escape her mother's clutches knowing that she was in line for it, and if she got it, her mother would try and get her hooks in and ruin her life. Her mother would be hanging over her, controlling her the way she does Jacques now forever. See, Winter is a good one. She is really a very nice and caring person, and her father knew that for sure, but she almost had to betray and disappoint him to skirt the position, fearing her mother, which she knows hurts Jacques because now he's left without someone, you know, sure to give it to. Winter could not handle the idea of that being her, so she left her dad in a horrible position that she feels guilty about because she had to escape. But she did escape, joined the military, and is in the same position that we know her in. But she outwardly presents as a very kind and friendly, in an authority kind of way. Sort of like your friendly local policeman sort of thing. Yes, in actuality she does hold quite a lot of power, but she is openly friendly and welcoming to people, trying to put on a nice image. Her hard military edge does exist, and she brings it out in combat and when it's required, but she tries to be a warm and inviting person. 
And I think she's on the middle ground when it comes to Weiss. She hated Weiss growing up because she was awful. But as she matured, Winter came to realize that it was the influences of the house on Weiss. It was their mother. So she seeks to bond with Weiss, trying to save her too, hoping to pull her away from that life and probably lying to herself by trying to really believe that this personality change is real. She wants to believe Weiss, even if deep down she probably knows it's a lie. So she's nice to Weiss and really making an effort. Which again, Weiss plays along with. It's sad knowing that underneath Weiss is completely unmoved by this. She doesn't care. And then the fall of Beacon happens. Here's what she contributes. Breaking up Team Ruby. See, Yang gets injured and Blake as well, similar to what happened. Everything sort of happens the same way. The events on the surface are the same, but everything motivating them and what happens after are different. So seeing this distraction, Ruby says she's gonna go and save the others, Pira and John. But it's here where Weiss drops the act and she says no. She looks at the situation, they've lost, the school is being destroyed, the help is leaving, they don't have a chance, and even if they did, the others, Jean and Pira, are not worth it. Then, to Ruby's horror, Weiss breaks it all down. It's all been an act since day one. She doesn't care about Ruby, or Blake, or even unconscious Yang with a missing arm, she doesn't care. They've run out their usefulness for now, they are not going to be a team, they might not recover from this, so why bother continuing to pretend? She's just going to go home. She doesn't care to see them again. They're not her friends. They were never her friends, but they were easy to manipulate, so that was nice. All of the positive influence on Ruby that helped break her hardened shell down and let her show some emotions and bond with people was all from someone who was faking it and didn't care the whole time. It was all a waste. It all meant nothing. And this is not an anime trope where Weiss isn't telling the truth. She is absolutely telling the truth, and she means every word. Then, she leaves. This helps make the murderous broken Ruby we saw before, as you can imagine. This Ruby has been burned from forming bonds with other people or trusting them. Her eye scar reminding her of Weiss hurts all the worse. The cold, evil manipulator broke the team forever here. And yeah, Weiss leaves. Jacques comes to see if she's alright to try and help everyone. She convinces him to take her home, and she plays the sympathy card. She just keeps winning, honestly. Using the sob story from Beacon to gain sympathy from her father and the public, including the deaths that happened there and how much she tried to help them. Communication is down, so no one can argue otherwise or knows about the truth. She basically positions herself as the hometown hero who valiantly did all she could to save her school and others. She is distraught at her failure and saw such atrocities. Everyone should really praise and revere Weiss. And it works out even better as she uses it to convince her dad that this is what she needs to be taken in, to run the SDC, showing her humanity and her poor father not wanting her to be in such danger again, trying to save her so he can take her into a much safer, comfier job in Atlas, gives in, and names her as successor. From there, she starts making moves slowly to put her father out of his position and accelerate her rise to power. She doesn't assassinate him or anything, as that's too suspicious, especially right after she gets named a successor if he were to die. She doesn't want that coming up. She's somewhat happy to ride out the time, but she will do everything she can to just make it speed up a little. So, instead of someone worrying like Robin Hill getting in the way, she'll help him get on the council. He's easy enough to manipulate, and it's better than someone with actual motivation like Robin taking that position and making things difficult. And from there, she can say how much she's learned from him, and leverages that for him to relinquish his position at the STC to become a full-time councilman, since doing both responsibilities is so taxing. And we work from there. Weiss is a total bitch, for real. And now she heads one of the largest, most profitable organizations in Remnant. Under a cold, dominant fist without a care for conditions or staff, she wields a lot of power and has Huntress training to back it up if you want to challenge her. Something she continues to work on on her own just in case someone tries having her killed or something. She's not stupid. I realize I didn't cover Whitley. Whitley, I think, is a very weak and soft-willed boy who Weiss tormented his whole life, and despite the fact his father is trying to get him out, he probably ends up failing and he ends up under Weiss's thumb as like an errand boy or assistant locked into the company sort of thing. So now let's talk the design. Just like last time, it's not about my poor art, but the design, and we'll go from the feet up as usual. Overall, you might think this is actually very normal. Here it is. And it really is quite normal. I said last time that Ruby wasn't too changed, but I realize now that this one is very much the least changed because she's fitting into more how she started and that attitude without any major injuries or issues that made her change. So 
I'll take away the background now, there we go, and we'll discuss. Starting off, I wanted to give her this image that it isn't totally a combat Weiss now, but she could still fight you if she needed to. This is Queen Weiss, rich and powerful. She has more vanity too, so she's also trying to show herself off a bit. So we have these standard hills, nothing super special, but we know Weiss can fight in them anyway. Though these are more dressy than usual, akin to what she wore to perform in Volume 4. Then immediately we have a long dress, no combat skirts here, we're being elegant. Long and more regal. She's also trying to appear more adult since she's going to head a company, commanding respect. So nothing that could be interpreted as little girlish, as like sort of tutu skirts and that kind of thing, she's just keeping them off her outfit. I know that you'll immediately spot I'm repeating the red lining thing, which is also in her jacket, but I'm doing so for a purpose. I think the contrast looks great with the dark blues and it would look really cool in motion and fighting. We have a very high split here, which the red draws more attention to when you get peaks that the underside is such a vibrant color, to again, being twofold. She's showing the legs because she's appearing more adult and she's just that kind of vain person, but it also very much allows her freedom of movement to fight if need be. The dress is a dress, I decided not to go for like a gradient or anything like she used before, keeping it darker and solid, and bring out more parts of her colour scheme darker to reflect her as a person. People get mad if you take away all her white obviously because she's the white one, so I put in more dark colours around it. Obviously villains don't have to dress dark, but in this case I'm just trying to reflect parts of her personality while keeping her base colour scheme there as well. Moving up, we also have the gossamer like cape off the waistcoat. I wanted to do it initially just to add layers to the outfit so it wasn't just a dress, making it a bit grander and a bit of a subtle touch, it's not overwhelming. It actually took inspiration straight from Winter, I think it's a bit unique and passing it on to another Schnee here I like a lot. Especially in this design, because she's so shut off from people, I like that there are influences in this costume from other people's outfits that she probably wouldn't admit to or doesn't even realise she put there. She doesn't think anyone has any effect on her, but there's little subtle things here. Like, even the increase in red could be seen as a ruby reference, you know, that sort of thing. But she's not doing it on purpose, she really does not care. Then we move up to the plain sash. I wanted some kind of belt to give an excuse for her wearing that Nasta, and she's worn sashes on her outfit before. Here I think it's soft enough to fit with the gown look, but it works rather than a harsh belt, say. Because yes, she does still wear the sword everywhere. It's a nice intimidating bit of her outfit that can be openly worn because swords are ceremonial enough to wear in public. It reminds others how dangerous she can be. She's not just a rich girl. Next we'll do the coat. I was considering bare shoulders to just make it a gown, but really she's always worn a jacket so we'll sort of tie that into the design. So as you can see I went for something really close to the initial jacket she wore, her sort of half jacket. But instead of wearing it open, I cinched it in, like Winter, and a little like Ruby. It makes her outfit more form-hugging, which again, Y sort of wants, and this maintains a more professional air than the sort of open jacket look. The tightly buttoned perfect fit has almost a military feel to it, and if you're running a company you want to look formal. Which is sort of why Winter does it, except here it's, you know, also to try and emphasise her looks as well. The three buttons honestly was just a joke for myself, because it's kind of like a classic snowman. I don't know, I just liked it, and making them black was too distracting, so they're more of a grey. Perhaps even white would have worked here too, honestly. I debated about the sleeves, like the cuffs. Her first was way too big and showy for the design. I didn't want anything sort of big and poofy on the end, so I just went with a basic sleeve with a slightly bigger cuff that you can see some of the red lining again. But it does give way to white gloves. It was going to be just bare hands, but the thin white glove is quite a formal look and also has an air of being uh, superior, above touching others who are below you sort of thing. The white glove and the white sleeve could be a little much, but that's why I wanted to make sure that the cuff end was a little bit wider and you could see some red to try and break up some of that, at least depending on your angle. Because if I make the gloves black, they don't really blend in, and if you make them like match her dress, it makes the dress look like it's some weird jumpsuit that runs under the sleeves, we don't want that, so just went with the white. She is also holding dust here, and that's not just a style choice, it's to remind me to talk about if she were to fight, how this sort of Weiss works. One thing about running the SDC is she is dusted up to the max. I actually think this dress is probably dust infused too, taking a cue from what she heard about with Cinder. It's a good way to keep herself armed at all times. She's also worked on using raw dust more because she can, she has as much of it at her disposal as she could ever want. So she's going to be using more than just glyphs and swords, but outright throwing around raw dust. Again, as described, that method of dust requires control, it's elegant in its simplicity, but it's very powerful. Hence, perfect for Weiss. Very fitting of her personality here. 
I'm not exactly sure what dust she stacks her dress with. I don't know. Uh, ice is on brand, I guess. Maybe it makes ice armor if she needs it and she runs out of aura, or it spits out ice shard projectiles. Who knows? Something like that. Obviously, for Weiss's chest, it's just the continued dress up from the jacket. What better way to show off her status and money than just whack a big jewel there dead center? So, I kept the dress pretty plain and clean to not distract from the jewel. It's similar to her clasp in volume 4 in shape, but this one's all blinged out to show the money and the status, and it continues in the red actually like Winter and Willow use. Also, let's be real, Weiss just doesn't have that much else to show off here. Moving on, I went for a high and broad collar. It just gives the Evil Queen vibes and always has. But I didn't want it to frill, because if it frilled out, it would interfere with how her hair is here. And also, I just didn't want it to be exactly the same as her original jacket. So instead, it's more of just a clean hoop. Uh, weirdly, what came to mind for it was actually Watts' initial jacket. It's not as crazy as that, but I'm just going to call it an Atlas fashion and say that she's, you know, incorporated some part of Atlas suit design that can be a thing and put it onto her jacket because she's running a company now. I know we don't see it everywhere else, but it's just a weird hand cannon thing. Just go with it. But also the slightly wider hoop here doesn't restrict her neck at all. Next up is obviously the head and the hair. So Weiss has always had the braid, but we're changing things up here. So if we want to be extravagant and elegant, nothing says that more than doing what she's done here and what she'd never do in real life. Just let the hair free. It's so long if you consider how long her braid is in the show and that it starts high on her head. In fact, I think I've shortened this hair to how long it would actually be. But here she has the help and the money to maintain it in this cascade of white and wearing it out hopefully conveys that she is not worried about you in the slightest she doesn't need it held back for combat but also if she were to fight you her tiara would actually hold it back a bit in case she actually does need to do that also once again it's kind of reminiscent of yang even if she doesn't realize it wearing the crazy long hair out although weiss's is of course like smooth and straight and pristine now onto the tiara more recently in her outfit it's been sort of a nod to the sdc logo and I think that stamping Weiss with the logo elsewhere on this design as the head of the company wouldn't really fit her at all. Plus, her hair covers her back so we can't put it there. So instead, I leant into it and made the tiara bigger and more explicitly the top part of the Schnee logo. She rules the SDC, so she's wearing it as a crown upon her head. The earrings stay, but they're bigger and more extravagant, just a touch. Which, of course, adds to more of this bling, but she wears them anyway. And in front of the tiara, I just sort of kept her bangs sort of from volume 4, maybe a little bit longer. Just to add to that eye covering, you know, theme we sort of seem to be on because she's a bad guy and she doesn't care about you. No emotional connection. And she can look a bit meaner and nastier with this face if she wants to. And it also hides her scar, a blemish I'm sure in this version she despises as being one of the only flaws to her perfect appearance as it were. The last thing I was thinking also just in terms of stories, can she summon? And I think it's actually yes. Despite her troubles with it in early life, I think rather than it being a big sort of breaking free moment of character development, it was instead an inheritance and legacy thing, forcing herself to get it right and live up to her name and Nick. So while I don't think she's as battle proficient as Weiss is now, just from all the experience of the battles she's gone through since Volume 3, this one is instead a lot shrewder and smarter and more cunning and doesn't play fair. She's still pretty great with a sword and she can train as much as she wants with all her money in her big mansion and servants and whatever else. And she spams dust on everything, not just from Mert Nasta, but raw crystals and from her clothes because she has an infinite supply basically. And she still is proficient with her summons that can act as bodyguards and intimidation tools as well on their own. Plus just money. She probably has armed security and top of the line security as well. Especially if she thinks she might get assassinated at any time. So taking down this Weiss would be very hard. You can't get close to her emotionally because no one can, she doesn't care, and trying to get to her through all her security would be hard enough, and then you also have to fight her and she doesn't fight fair, she set herself up very well. High atop her SDC castle. But yes, here's Weiss, trying to walk the line between elegant, powerful queen while still being combat ready if need be. It definitely leans more into the queen side of things, but it's meant to, and the fighting stuff is really just there as an intimidation tactic, or in a pinch, or if, you know, someone comes for her head. She's showing off. She's power hungry, greedy, manipulative, dominant, and ruthless. The Ice Queen indeed. Shattering Team Ruby without a care and taking what she wants from the world. But. That's all for now. Remember, if you put in the hard work to make fan art of things, please send them to me on my Twitter. Don't let your work go to waste, because I want to see it no matter what it is, I promise you. Anyway, my name is Rigo. Hope you have a wonderful day, and I hope I did alright.